Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for loving me, loving us, coming and living, touching, speaking, and then giving yourself without reservation, taking my place, paying the price for my sin, through the shedding of your blood, washing away. All my shame and guilt and condemnation. Suffering rejection and separation from your Father. But then rising. Coming alive to give me a brand new life. That I would never be a slave again. I would never be bound to fear. And that I would be free. Thank you today for liberty and freedom that is mine, that belongs to all of us here as we celebrate your resurrection and we celebrate our life. We celebrate all that you've done on our behalf and we praise you and we thank you with full and overflowing hearts as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. And in your name, we declare this and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can be seated. You know, as I sit here during all the songs, I'm in, just having a wonderful time, and I just go from rejoicing to tears, and I'm just so grateful. I'm, go, I'm so grateful that I know I'm, I'm so grateful to be free. You know, this, this week as we have celebrated from Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Today, east of the resurrection. This is a culmination of, of the greatest event really since the beginning of, of human history. For thousands and thousands of years, men and women have waited for this time. Pastor Josel preached a, a message on Friday night, on Good Friday, about 300 or over 300 prophecies fulfilled. For thousands of years, prophetic words. In fact, the very first prophetic word about one who would crush the head of the serpent was in Genesis. From the beginning of this book to the end of it, it talks about this time period and what was coming, what would be accomplished on our behalf. The resurrection is all about life. Can you say life? Oh, that was exciting. Come on, can you say life? life. The resurrection is all about life and freedom and, and a newfound joy that you and I should have. Man is free. And Jesus is the only one who could set us free. To, to understand really, and even in these songs and, and the verses that, J.B. was going through and quoting about freedom and life, real life. If you think about the creation, this, this resurrection and the power of it deals with the number one problem that has plagued man and the result of that problem. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus can only give us eternal life if he's alive. How can someone who died and stayed in the grave give you and I life? Not through a principle, not through a memory, not through a good teaching, but because he's risen from the dead, what he comes alive with is to give to you and I. When you go back to the beginning, Genesis, God made man. 
The Bible says that he fashioned him out of the dirt or the dust of the earth. You can take your pick, dirt or dust. Maybe somebody's name is Dusty. I don't know. <laughs> and he fashioned man out of the dust or the, the dirt of the earth. He has this form. But then it says he breathed into him the breath, or that word breath is spirit of life. And when he breathed into him, man came alive. Now remember, before that, God said, let us make man in our image. Not just physical on the outside. The Bible says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when God breathed into man, he caused him to become a life living spirit in a physical body made out of the earth, dirt or dust. But on the inside, he breathed into him spirit and life. It was eternal. But he gave a warning to the first man and woman. Well, actually, he gave it to the man who was supposed to relay it to the woman. That's another story. He said, well, if you... Everything that's here you can partake of, but the fruit of that one tree, don't eat of that, because in the day that you eat of it, you'll die. You'll die. The day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you'll die. Everybody say die. Well, we know that Eve ate of the fruit, and then she gave it to Adam. They ate it, and then they ran and they hid. They didn't fall over, because dead people don't run. Dead people don't hide. And when God came looking for them in the garden, Adam, where are you? Adam goes, well, I'm here. And because I heard you coming in the garden, and I ran and I hid because I was ashamed, because I was naked and ashamed. Oh, who told you you were naked? Dead people don't run. Dead people don't know they're naked. Dead people have no fear. Dead people don't hide. God said, the day you eat of it, you'll die. What happened? Death came into that eternal part, that spiritual part. There came a separation on the inside. If Adam and Eve would have eaten the fruit and fell over dead, they would have been right there where they ate the fruit. But there was a death, a disconnect that came into their spirit still eternal on the inside, but no longer carrying that life and nature that they were created to carry. And so we have the very first prophetic word about the one coming who would crush the serpent's head. And throughout the Old Testament, 300 prophecies, of the one who would come. Even when we talk about healing, when we refer to Isaiah uh, 53, and he carried our sicknesses and diseases. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The prophetic word concerning the Messiah that is going to come, that through his death on the cross, what he was going to purchase and provide for us. And so all these thousands of years, and then Jesus comes to deal with what? Good Friday, what did he deal with? He, he went to the cross, and he dealt with sin. What is the result of sin? Death. So he goes to the cross, sheds his blood, and washes away and removes the penalty for our sin. After you deal with sin, the only next thing you deal with is the, the result of what that sin brought, which was death. So he deals with the root cause, sin, on Friday, and his resurrection, he deals with what sin had brought to man, death. He pays the price for our sin, and then he overcomes the penalty that that sin had brought, which is eternal life. Easter is all about life. And I can celebrate because I am a purchased possession, washed by the blood of the Lamb, and death has no power over me either. I may be physical and natural, and, and, and you might be the best-looking thing on planet Earth, but you're still natural and temporary. You're just good-looking dust. So be careful. Don't get, you don't, don't get lifted up in pride because that body of yours is just dust. That sounds better than dirt. Don't really want to call anybody dirt on Sunday. That's not kind. But this is temporary. It's natural. 
It's physical. But what's on the inside is eternal. And that's why Jesus said, I came that you might have life. What is he wanting to do? He's wanting to remove what stole the intention of God, that man would not be temporary or be separated, so he has to pay the penalty for sin, and then he, he has to give of himself, and then he has to pay the price for the result of sin, which was death. Therefore, we have the cross, and we have the burial, and we have the resurrection. In Luke chapter 24, referring back to the first day of the week, it says, this is in Luke, shoddy read out of John, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Understand this, God did not remove the stone so Jesus could get out. He removed the stone so we could see in. When you're raising Jesus from the dead, a stone is not a problem. We needed to be able to see in that the tomb was empty. This message that we preach, the cross, the resurrection, there's no, there is no other message like it. There is no religion in the world like it. This is not just one book of many truths. This is one book above all. In fact, the words in here are either true or it's the greatest deception and lie ever to be brought to earth. But they're true. From the beginning to the end. Jesus didn't come just to give us another way. He came because he was the way, he was the truth, and he is the life. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were perplexed about this, and behold, two men stood by them in shining garment, angels. As they were afraid and bowed their face to the earth, and said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee. Remember what he said. He, he told you that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. See, there's a lot of things when Jesus is speaking into our hearts, it sounds so good, it sounds so amazing, it sounds so supernatural that we almost can't comprehend it. But when you are faced with an empty tomb and now the angel's talking to you and then they go, yeah, 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 oh yeah. We remember what he said. What I want to do is just share some verses with you today. I want you to remember what the Word says to you to bring you peace, to understand that your faith is not just merely in pages, uh, uh, in words on a piece of paper. Your faith is in a person. It's in a Savior who was perfect, who gave himself for you, who died, and on the third day rose from the dead. He is alive. And he sees, and he hears, and he touches, and he answers, and is present with us here today. Greatest event in human history is the cross and the resurrection, and it's foundational to our faith. Matthew 28, 16 the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted that it was really him. Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, all power in absolute rule. Understand this, we serve a risen, glorious, all-powerful Savior. We are not involved in just religious activity we do not walk in a weak religion, but you and I have come into a living relationship with a resurrected Savior. And we have a faith that's alive, that comes out of our hearts, not a mere struggle that's trying to come from a little bit of knowledge in our heads. He said, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, 
Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances, and on every occasion, even until the end of the age. My faith is not in a great teacher or a great teaching or a positive uh, principle or good moral values. My faith is in a resurrected Jesus who is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, and his spirit lives on the inside of me. It is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who's risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, where the Bible says where he ever lives to make intercession for us. In Acts chapter 1, when he was talking to the disciples and he told them to stay in Jerusalem, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Witnesses of what? That he's alive. That he's alive. That they would bear witness, that they would have a testimony. Not only did we walk with him before the cross, but we've seen him. We know the tomb is empty. They didn't steal the body. They didn't hide it. Jesus is risen from the dead, and because he's risen from the dead, it validates everything that the Word of God and every prophecy has said about him. A lot of people died on the cross. The cross at that time was one of the cruelest forms of, of punishment for people. Jesus wasn't the only one to be crucified. In fact, the day he was crucified, he had a thief, one on the left and one on the right. Before him and after him, many were crucified. So it wasn't just the cross. It was the blood he shed and the reason he was on the cross. Understand this. Everything he did, he did for me and you. He had no lack. He had no need. He was perfect. So when he came... He came to die as a lamb for you and I to shed his blood in his perfection, in his innocence. He took my guilt and shame because I was not perfect. I was not innocent. I was incredibly guilty. But he took all of that upon himself and gave me righteousness. Everything he did, he did for me. And then when he suffered a separation from the Father and he was buried, he died for me. But then he rose and conquered death for me. So not only did he remove what caused the greatest issue in my life, which was death in my spirit, but his resurrection brings life. So when this body, if it gets broken in an accident, if somehow a lingering disease causes this body to stop functioning, this inner man that I have, this spirit man that I have, steps out of this body right into eternity. So I don't have to fear death. Why? Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I'd have no shame or guilt in life, and I have no fear of death, because between the cross and the resurrection, Jesus is taking care of it all for me. Resurrection Sunday is all about life. It's all about liberty. It's all about freedom. In John chapter 11, previous, the previous week before Palm Sunday, Jesus actually goes to visit Mary and Martha because they had got a message that Lazarus had, was sick. When he got there, he had already died and was buried. And Jesus tells his sister, well, your brother will live. Mary said, well, I know that in the last day he, he will live. And Jesus says... Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. See, before the cross, he's already declaring, this is who I am. He was always declaring who he was. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I want to tell you, if Jesus is Lord of your life, understand, get this in context, You'll never die. The physical part of you, the natural part of you, the earthly, temporary part of you will come to an end. But you see, I'm not a body. I'm a spirit. 
I have a soul and I live in a body. And the older I get, I watch my body change. I watch my hair turn colors. I watch unnecessary what my granddaughter Harper calls winkles. I said, you mean wrinkles? Yeah, she goes, Papa, you have winkles. Yeah, honey, winkles are a sign of, I, I, yeah, yeah, I got winkles. She looks at my fingers and she goes, Papa, you have winkles on your fingers. Yeah, they, they seem to be growing everywhere because my body is getting older. But why is it that even though your body age or gets weaker on the outside, on the inside, and the dangerous thing is sometimes you try to live how you feel on the inside and your body on the outside is going, hey, hey, slow down. <laughs> you're, you're not in your 20s anymore. You know, I remember a time came I had to stop playing basketball with young adults because on the inside I said, I can do it. But the next morning on the outside, it's like, oh, my God, why did I do that? My heart said, you can do this. My body goes, oh, no, 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 those days are gone. Because <laughs> you feel so full of life on the, in, on, on the inside. But the outside, you know, there's one verse that I know none of us really like. And I know we're supposed to love all of the Bible, and, and I do. But there's one verse that's really challenging. It says, though the outward man decay. Ugh. The inward man is renewed day by day. See, you got two men. You got one on the outside, one on the inside. One on the outside is getting older. The one on the inside is renewed every day. I could, little, I could use a little renewing on the outside also. But you see, on the inside, I'm eternal. The Bible says, Wherefore has been given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we become a partaker of a divine nature. My physical body, I'm a carrier of the life and the Spirit of God on the inside of me. I'm alive on the inside because of the resurrection. He paid the price for my sin, and then he defeated death, hell, and the grave and every demonic power and said, freedom. Greatest bondage man ever had was sin. And then the penalty was the, the fear of death. Jesus dealt with sin and then he gives us life, eternal life. So we can live our life to the fullness here on earth, but realize I don't just have to live for the earth because I have an eternity that I will step into. Oh, I can enjoy blessings on the earth, but I want to live for a reward that I have in heaven. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, that is grafted in, joined to him by faith, in him as Savior. He is a new creature, reborn, renewed by the Holy Spirit. All things, previous moral and spiritual conditions, have passed away. Behold, new things have come, because spiritual awakenings bring a new life. That's why when we believe in who he is and what he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection, John says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whatever's born of God overcomes the world. Why? Because my faith is in one who has all power and authority in heaven and in earth. He's the one I talk to. He's the one I worship. He's the one I pray to. He's the one I rely upon. And there is no circumstance that beyond, is beyond his control because he paid the penalty for sin and he conquered death. He is the author of life. And that's who I have faith in. That's who I pray to. Not a memory of someone who lived and walked the earth 2,000 years ago, but one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1 Peter 1, 3 Blessed, gratefully praised, and adored be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who according to his abundant and boundless mercy caused us to be born again. A second birth. That is, he reborn from above 
spiritually transformed and renewed and set apart for his purpose to an ever-living hope and confident assurance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Your faith and understanding in the resurrection of Jesus is absolutely essential in having a living faith. Born anew into an inheritance which is imperishable. imperishable. It's beyond the reach of change. Undefiled, unfading. This is your inheritance. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are being protected and shielded by the power of God through your faith for salvation. Ready to be revealed to you in these last times. That's why Jesus in John 14, when he's speaking to the disciples concerning anything that's going to come, he said, listen, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't back off. Don't act cowardly. Don't be afraid. Believe confidently in God and trust in me. Have faith. Hold on to it. Rely on it. Keep going. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself so that where I am, you will be also. That's why resurrection is all about life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty. And we are all found to be a bunch of liars. He says false witnesses, but if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, this is the greatest deception that's ever come to planet Earth. But it's not a deception. It's a truth. And Jesus is alive. Christ is not risen. He says your faith is empty. If Christ is not risen, you're still in your sins. You're lost. You have no hope. We can't save ourselves, fix ourselves, cleanse ourselves, heal ourselves, and give ourselves life. It took a spotless Lamb of God to do that. First John chapter 5, verse 11, this is a testimony that God has given to us eternal life. You don't get eternal life after you die. You step, in, you step into eternity with eternal life because you receive life before you die. It's a choice. It's a decision. He who has the Son has life. Why? Because the Son is the giver of life. The Son is the one who has removed the penalty of sin, and then he's broken the power of death, and through removing the penalty of sin and, and resurrecting from the dead, he now brings life life to you. And that's why that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Why? Because he's Lord of my life. He's the Savior who shed his blood on the cross, but he rose from the dead, and I serve a living Savior. Not a dead preacher, not a dead prophet, not a good man who was dead. I was on a plane years ago, and anytime you're on a plane and you pull out your Bible, people have different kind of reactions. And uh, I pulled out my Bible and I was reading it. And the guy goes, oh, so you're uh, one of them. I said, one of them? So you, you believe it? You believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah. He goes, ah, I really don't. I said, you don't believe in him at all? Oh, no, no. He goes, no, I believe he was a good man. I believe what he taught was good and how he lived was good, but I don't believe that whole, you know, cross and death, burial, and resurrection. I, I don't believe that. I said, well, you, you contradict yourself. Because if you think he was a good man, but you don't believe he's the son of God, if you believe he was a good man and his teaching was good, but you don't believe he's risen from the dead, uh, let me challenge you on this. He's either who he says he is, 
or is he's the greatest liar and deceiver that's ever walked the earth? He can't be a good man and deceive and lie to people. And he looked at me. I said, you have a choice to make. Because he wasn't just a good man. He was the son of God who died for you, rose from the dead, and I explained what he goes, I, 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 I got to think about that. I said, yeah, he's not just a good man. He's a son of God, and he loves you. He died for you, paid the price for your sins. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. So there would never be a penalty of sin because sin has been taken care of. But now he broke the power of death and hell, and he gives you eternal life. Now that is not just a good man. That's a great Savior. He goes, ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I need to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Paul says, if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God not made with hands that's eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, de desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. My father in America is 90 four years old. That gives me hope that I have genes that are going to cause me to live a long time. <laughs> but he's very unhappy. He's, he's gotten weaker and weaker, but whenever I talk to him every day, and if I talk to him, I said, Dad, how are you? Oh, terrible. Well, I know he feels terrible because his body's weak and he, he's dealing with different things, but he complains every day. You know what he complains about? He's still here. He doesn't want to be on earth anymore. Son, pray. You have faith. Pray. Okay, Dad, what? I want to go to heaven. I want to see your mom. I miss your mom. I want to go, I want to, go to heaven. I don't want to be on earth anymore. I'm tired. I don't want to. I don't, I, no, I'm just, my body's falling apart. I don't want to live like this. He has this desire to want to be clothed with this eternal body and put off this one that's weak and old and falling apart. He, he just wants to go. He complains every day. I just want to go. I told Shadi one day, Shadi, help me. She goes, no, Dad, I can't do that. That's, I'll go to jail if I help you. <laughs> I, I, that, that doesn't work. You're in heaven and I'm in jail. No, I'm not going to do that. Paul, pray. So I, we prayed. Next day we came back. He says, you have no faith. I'm still here. <laughs> Dad, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's between you and the Lord. Maybe he doesn't want me. Oh, he wants you. Just enjoy your grandkids. He goes, I've enjoyed my grandkids and my great-grandkids. I'm tired. I just want to go. He has no fear in death because he knows the price has been paid. He goes, you know, I haven't always been a good man. Dad, and it's not about who you are and what you've done and how you've been. It's all about who he is and what he did for you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he has saved us. His blood took care of the sin, and his resurrection brings us life. Well, pray again. Well, so I'm just... And if I call him up tomorrow, I know what he's going to say. I'm still here. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also will give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. The Bible says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, makes us free from law of sin, cross, and death, resurrection. Never minimize when he said, I came to give you life. Yeah, the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ, because he is the resurrection and the life. Between the cross, between the resurrection that we celebrate today, he took care of my sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am free. Never be bound again. Now, I, I could still sin if I choose to, 
but I'm not sold under sin. I'm not a slave to sin. I've been set free. Yeah, but, but you have that, that, that old nature. Oh, no, no, I have a new nature. I have a divine nature because, you see, I've received the exceeding great and precious promises. The, pro the price has been paid. The blood has been shed. I have received it. I am purchased. I am forgiven. I am washed, and I am clean. So sin has no power over me. I'm free. And death has been conquered. And that's why we celebrate the resurrection. Oh, come on, somebody... God wants us to understand we're not weak, fearful, to be overcome, defeated, sad, disappointed, poor, and sick. We are a purchased possession. We are children of the Most High God. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul writes this, I'm praying for you that your eyes, that the eyes of your understanding would be open. Like what Shadi referred to when Jesus said, Mary, her eyes open, and she saw it was Jesus. Oh, that God would open our eyes, that we would understand and comprehend, that you would know the hope of your calling. What are the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints? That's you and I. And what is the exceeding greatness of his powers towards us who believe? God wants every one of you to know today the exceeding greatness of his power to you who believe According to the working of his power, which he worked in Christ and raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also which is to come. He raised him up. God wants you to know there's resurrection power. Resurrection power, the same power that raised him from the dead is working in you. The same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you. There's only one Holy Spirit. He was in and upon Jesus, and he's in and upon you and I. That resurrection power in life is ours today because we call him Lord. Ephesians 2, 4, J.B. read this, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised up together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh. So many verses. Hebrews 2. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he would destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lives, all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus said in Revelation 1.17, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Understand, every time we baptize somebody, as we identify with him as Savior, we die to our sins. What do you do with things that are dead? You bury them, and then once they're buried, they're raised to walk in a brand new life. Receiving Jesus as Lord of your life, your sins were nailed to the cross with him and washed by his blood. You are dead to your past, but then you're raised up to walk in a brand new life. That's what water baptism is. It's all about identification. I died with Christ, and I am resurrected to live with him. Death and sin have no power over me because of the resurrection. Can somebody say amen? Well, I need to close this. Because you can go from Matthew to the book of Revelation and everything. It's just full of the cross, the power of the cross, the power of the shedding of his blood, and the power of the resurrection and what it means to you and I. Bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day in which we celebrate your resurrection. I thank you for the knowledge of your word as I have 
endeavor to bring forth different verses so we can remember your word. Remember that you conquered principalities and powers and you made a public display over them, triumphing over them in your resurrection, defeating the power of death and the grave. You demonstrated authority over every demonic power in your life and especially in your resurrection. We have your name today, that name that is above every name. Your word declares there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved. That name of Jesus that represents life and mercy and grace and kindness. You came as a lamb and you rose victorious as our king. Thank you. Lord, I pray for everybody here this morning and those who've been watching. Those who don't know you, been to church, heard about church, and heard about you, have knowledge of you, but have never opened their heart and said, Jesus, I have need of you in my life. I have need of a Savior. I don't want to just be involved in religious activity. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want head knowledge. I want a heart of faith. That when I pray, I know that you hear me. I want my heart and my mind to be filled with the, the remembering of your words. Who you are to me and who I am to you. I have need of you. You came for a reason to give yourself, not just for the world, but for me. If you're here this morning in this service or watching online, you've never prayed to make Jesus Lord of your life. I want to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. Lord, that means I submit to you. I come into the place where I submit my will to yours. Even as in the garden, Jesus, when you were speaking to the Father, you said, not my will, but your be done. Yours be done. Maybe people here today need to pray that same prayer. Not my will, yours be done. I have need of a Savior. That I can receive all that you've already done through the shedding of your blood and your resurrection, washing away my sin and giving me life. If you've never prayed that prayer, I want you to pray this together with me. In fact, church, let's go ahead and pray this together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus, the Son of God, who came as a lamb, shed his blood to wash away all my sins, and on the third day, rose from the dead. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, risen from the dead, and I receive you as my Lord. Thank you for receiving, cleansing, and filling me with a brand new life. I declare I am delivered out of darkness into light, out of death into eternal life. My body becoming the temple of your Holy Spirit. I thank you. I am saved and I am free and I will walk with you all my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everybody.